Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattooed Historian's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter pages. I appreciate each and every one of you for coming on board tonight to hear our presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattoo Historian, as my, whichever way it is, my name suggests over here. I always get that backwards. I don't know which way it is on the, on the screen. I'll get it sooner or later. I hope all of you are having a great time tonight and we really appreciate you again coming on this evening. Uh, we're having a little difficulty here with uh, Facebook, which I will work on while we go into our presentation. Thank you, everybody on YouTube and Twitter for being here. Uh, tonight, we have my friend Alex Fitzgerald Black back for another evening to talk about the DEP rate. Alex is the executive director of the Juno Beach Center Association. Alex, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well tonight. How are you, John? I'm doing well. I'll be even better once I figure out why Facebook is not allowing us to stream on there. But at least we're on two other platforms. Uh, but yeah, how are how are things with you? You have a new board now. Congratulations. Are you I do. Much, it's... much sleep or anything like that? <laughs> doing my best to get sleep, but it's been it's been difficult the last couple of weeks for sure. Just getting used to it now. I bet. I bet. But I'm, I'm so glad that we're going to be able to hear uh, from you about this very important topic and one that is 80 years ago this week. So this is a great time to be talking about that. Uh, and everyone, we're going to let Alex flow through his presentation here for a while and school us on the DEP rate, especially all of us Americans who don't know much about the DEP rate, even though there were Americans there. Uh, and I'm sure Alex is going to go over that for a little bit. Uh, and we're going to save the questions for the end tonight. So if you have any questions as we go through, please let me know in the comments. I will mark those as I'm off uh, air here, and we'll bring them back on at the end. So, Alex, I'm going to pull up your uh, presentation here, my friend, and I'm going to take myself down, and you can take it away. Perfect, John. Well, thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, as John alluded to, there will be some American content in this presentation uh, though most of it uh, will be Canadian. Um, I want to get started uh, by acknowledging a couple of sponsors. Um, this uh, presentation is based on our exhibition, which uh, I just showed you the poster there, From Dieppe to Juno, the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. And we had a number of sponsors who helped us put this uh, exhibition together over in France. Uh, the War Heritage Institute in Belgium, they're kind of uh, a series of major military museums in Belgium were key partners on this, providing uh, both historical expertise uh, and uh, artifacts and, and iconography for the exhibition. We also had financial supports from uh, the Normandy region, from the French uh, Ministry of Defense, essentially, and from, in Canada, uh, C-SPAN shipyards. Uh, uh, so we really appreciate all their support. Uh, here's a little bit of an outline of my presentation. I'll get to that in a second uh, after I uh, give you some opening remarks here. So August 19th, 2022, this Friday, marks 80 years since the Dieppe Raid, also known as Operation Jubilee. In that raid, in nine hours, a force of nearly 5,000 Canadians suffered over 800 killed, with two-thirds of the force dead, wounded, or captured. It was Canada's darkest moment of the Second World War, and it remained shrouded in controversy, mystery, and tragedy. And for decades, the disaster dominated Canadians' collective memory of the war. The Juno Beach Center is marking this major commemorative milestone with that new exhibition I told you about, From Dieppe to Juno, the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. The exhibit brings together unique voices of Dieppe that allow visitors to discover the raid's nuance and complexity. From Dieppe to Juno and explores our shifting understanding of the raid, its links to Juno Beach on D-Day. After all, we are a museum on Juno Beach, on the D-Day landing beach, and we're talking about a failure in a place of victory. And finally, the liberation of the town of Dieppe in September 1944 by Canadian troops. So the exhibition was divided into five zones. You can see them on the screen there. This is basically going to be the outline of my presentation today. We're going to talk about the context, 1940, 1942. You know, what's the what's the global situation? Why is the DF raid happening? We'll talk about the raid itself, try to kind of give you an idea of what the plan was and, and the gap between that and what actually happened. 
We're going to talk a little bit about the propaganda impact of the raid and how the raid was used as a weapon by both sides uh, in the war. We're going to talk a little bit about the captivity experience um, for you know many of the Canadians and, and uh, other nationalities who were at Dieppe. It wasn't just a one-day experience. That day was just the start of a long uh, uh, period in German captivity. And then finally, in Zone 5, talk a little bit about remembering. And again, that notion of explaining a failure in a site of victory. You know, how did we go about doing that? So we had a number of different elements that made up the exhibition, different types of content. So, you know, iconography, photographs, artif artifacts. We relied heavily on biographies to tell the stories of various uh, participants in the Dieppe raid, anybody from kind of a private soldier uh, to, you know, Lord Louis Mountbatten, the chief of combined operations, who I'll talk about in a moment. We tried to intersperse the exhibition with a number of quotes from either participants of the Dieppe raid, people who, you know, kind of observed the Dieppe raid from, a, from afar, perhaps, or historians more recently and what they have thought about the raid uh, uh, many years later. We also had lots of text in the exhibition, and we had lots of infographics, which are going to be part of my presentation today. So starting in Zone 1, the context. So in May and June of 1940, France was overrun by the German military. And before France had even surrendered, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who had just become Prime Minister less than a month before this, was already giving thought to raiding the French quote, coast. He wrote a note to his uh, chief military advisor, Gen Major General Hastings Ismay, and he said, Enterprises must be prepared with specially trained troops of the hunter class who can develop a ring of terror down these coasts, first of all on the butcher and bolt policy, but later on, and perhaps as soon as we are organized, we could surprise Calais or Bologna, kill it or capture the Hun garrison, and hold the place until all preparations to reduce it by siege or heavy storm had been made and then away. So even, you know, before France had kind of completely capitulated to the Nazis, Churchill was already thinking about, you know, this butcher and bolt policy, this raiding policy. So fast forward from the spring of 1940 to two years later, the spring of 1942. What's happened in the European war since then? Well, in 1941, Germany began a uh, war with the Soviet Union, a massive war on the Eastern Front. The war in North Africa had been going on since late 1940, and at this point in the spring of 1942, it's not looking very good for Britain. There are German-Italian forces threatening the British position in Egypt and the Suez Canal, that crucial link uh, to the empire. America is now in the war, you know, has been, you know, for six months or so since December of 1941. Uh, but the Japanese are on the march in the Pacific and the Far East, you know, taking some attention, you know, from, from both the, the British and the Americans at this point. The Americans are also, they have, you know, a Europe first policy. They want to, and they realize that ending the war against um, Nazi Germany is going to help with the war against Japan far more than ending the war against Japan is going to help with the war against Nazi Germany. So the Americans are exerting pressure on Churchill's government to launch a strike on mainland Europe to assist the Soviets. And the Soviets themselves are also pushing for the same. Now in 1942, early 1942, and even before, um, Britain has made a series of raids on the French coast. Uh, there was the Bruneval raid, Operation Biting, uh, the image at the top of the screen with the, uh, the large uh, house uh, and the radar dish next to it there was one such operation where the British were after, well, that radar dish effectively to learn more about, you know, how the Wurzburg radar worked. Another operation, uh, quite successful, but also quite deadly for those who participated, is the Saint-Nazaire raid, uh, Operation Chariot, where the British basically drove a German destroyer into a dry dock. A German destroyer, a British destroyer, might have actually been an American destroyer that the British had been given by the Americans earlier in the war. They drove it into the dry dock and the idea was to blow that up, and they did, uh, to destroy the dry dock so that large German warships could not use it as a place uh, to refit and get repairs. So these raids are getting larger and more complex over time, all under the leadership of what was called a Combined Operations Headquarters, and I'll get to that in a moment. Another piece of context that's important is the state of the Battle of the Atlantic. 
Um, unfortunately, although the American entry in the war is very helpful for the Allies, and, and, and especially will pay dividends in you know, 1943, 1944, and towards the end of the war, um, the Battle of the Atlantic after the Americans join the war takes a huge turn for the worse. Um, U-boats uh, begin preying on Allied convoys at an alarming rate during this period. In particular, um, there's a, a second happy time, as the U-boat commanders called it, off of the American uh, seaboard, where they're sinking uh, uh, many American and other flagships that are not running in convoys. They didn't have a convoy system uh, set up at the time. And in 1942, for the war, the Allies lost uh, over 1,300 vessels and only managed to sink 87 U-boats in return. Now, another significant part of the reason for these heightened losses was the inability of British code breakers to break the U-boat code. They had been reading the U-boat codes for some time uh, before early 1942, and that allowed them to basically route the convoys around the German wolf packs, around the German submarines, so they would never actually meet the convoy and never have a chance to, 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 you know, to, to ambush them, to fire their torpedoes and to sink uh, these vessels. Um, the British had read the code until February of 1942, but at that point, the Germans introduced, um, uh, they'd always been using, uh, before this, an Enigma machine uh, to communicate between their U-boats at sea and their headquarters back in you know, France and in Germany. Um, but they introduced a four-rotor Enigma, which was a much more complex uh, uh, machine uh, that basically locked the British out of being able to read those codes. And so this is this is what resulted, you know, in 1942, the Battle of the Atlantic. That's not going very well, and th it's this is one of the most important battles of the war, frankly. Uh, no invasion of the continent, and ultimately we know the the only way to defeat Nazi Germany is to return to the continent and defeat their armed forces. No invasion can succeed without secure supply lines across the Atlantic. All of that, you know, American, you know, industrial might uh, is not going to be very helpful uh, to to the British and to the Allies. Uh, and the Canadians in the war, unless it can actually get overseas. Um, so one objective of the Dieppe raid, arguably, was to assist in this intelligence war. I think it's actually been uh, proven, uh, I, would, I would argue, uh, that it was certainly one of the objectives was to assist in the intelligence war. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Some of the big players uh, on the scene here. So we've got on the left, uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten, uh, he has relationships uh, with British royalty. He's got a really good relationship with Winston Churchill. Uh, he's actually kind of in 1941, he's just a, a British destroyer captain um, in the Royal Navy. Uh, but he very quickly uh, rises in rank, you know, from captain to uh, vice admiral in a very, very short period of time. And he's given this uh, position of chief, of chief of combined operations. And I'll, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that was about in, in a second. On the right, you have uh, the Canadian general who, for the Dieppe raid in August 1944, was the military officer responsible for the raid. And he was in charge of the 1st Canadian Corps, which was overseas in the United Kingdom, uh, preparing training uh, for an eventual, you know, uh, battle with German forces, you know, presumably on the continent somewhere. Um, and he was really keen on getting the Canadians involved in uh, the fight because the Canadians had been, you know, some of the Canadians had been overseas since late 1939 and really hadn't seen any action yet. Um, and actually, there's a quote on the next slide, uh, the second quote down. He, he said in July 1942, it will be a tragic humiliation if American troops get in action before Canadians who have been waiting in England for three years. Uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, as I said, he uh, kind of explained his role and, and what his command was supposed to do. My responsibility was to prepare for the invasion. And in the meantime, I was to carry on with the commando raids to keep our offensive spirit alive, learn the technique of landing on enemy occupied coasts and keep the Nazi on the qui vive. So he's got a very clear you know, mandate. Your job is to you know, build combined operations uh, test new equipment, new landing craft, new techniques uh, in amphibious operations, in combined operations linking air, land, and sea forces. Um, but uh, the, these combined operations forces, these raiding forces, also had the opportunity to grab intelligence uh, from the enemy. And that's uh, kind of another layer uh, to this. Again, I keep alluding to it, and I will get to it in a second. Um, here are the force commanders 
uh, for the raid as it was uh, finally constructed. Uh, some There were some changes in this over time. Um, we had the commander of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division as the military or ground force commander, Major General John Hamilton Roberts. We have the Air Force commander, uh, who is also the commander of number 11 group in fighter command uh, in the UK. That's Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, uh, who later goes on to play a role in the uh, invasion of Normandy uh, for D-Day. He's uh, basically the commander of the Air Forces involved uh, for that operation. And then we have the Naval Force Commander, um, who is also a staff officer at Combined Operations Headquarters. And he, uh, Captain John Hughes Hallett of the Royal Navy, was one of the key planners uh, who kind of envisioned the Dieppe raid, uh, wrote, wrote most of the planning for it, um, and is perhaps responsible uh, uh, for a lot of uh, uh, the plans and, and how they were set out. Uh, and he actually ended up becoming, uh, later in the in the game, originally there was an admiral who was going to be the naval force commander, but Captain Hallett stepped in to be the naval commander as well on the day. This is a quote from Air Marshal uh, Lee Mallory uh, on the eve of uh, the Dieppe raid, and he wrote this to his command. It's kind of like an Eisenhower-type uh, statement, you know, before D-Day, but this is for Dieppe said, we are about to take part in the first assault delivered by the combined forces of the three services against the continent of Europe in this war. It is an honor to take part in so momentous an operation, the success of which will make history, will raise the confidence, and uplift the hearts of those fighting for the Allied cause. There are a number of reasons posited over the years by various historians uh, uh, for the Dieppe raid. Um, and, 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 and perhaps it's kind of hard to kind of narrow down, you know, just one and maybe some of them there's truth kind of maybe a little bit of truth behind some of them maybe you know we could probably dispute others um appeasing soviet dictator joseph stalin you know the idea of you know kind of what churchill was talking about let's like force the enemy to come and fight us you know on the coast or at least build up a force on the coast to prevent us from doing you know future operations of this nature yeah, pressure from the americans for a second front in 1942 i think this one has largely been uh, debunked a little bit in the sense that um, Operation Torch, which was the invasion of North Africa in November of 1942, uh, was kind of the compromise that ended up uh, being settled before the Dieppe raid actually occurred. Uh, the Americans were pushing for that second front. The British were kind of pushing against it, and they eventually kind of compromised and went with Operation Torch, uh, which in, in my estimation was actually probably a good decision. Overall, maybe, maybe or maybe not, the Dieppe raid shows that to be the case. Lord Louis Mountbatten himself uh, perhaps was engaged in a little bit of empire building. He wanted to be, you know, he was part of the command that was kind of preparing for D-Day in the early days. And he wanted, you know, perhaps he wanted that command, you know, for the eventual invasion of Northwest Europe. There's some historians who say that perhaps he did this operation without proper approval from uh, the British chiefs of staff and from the prime minister. There's no official you know, written order or anything like that coming from the chiefs of staff. But Mountbatten's excuse essentially was, well, this was supposed to be a secret operation, so nothing was written down. Um, very unlikely that it was an unauthorized action. It's fairly clear reading various diaries um, that the operation was not a surprise you know, to Churchill at the time or to um, Lord Allenbrook, who was the chief of the Imperial General Staff at the time, they, they seemed to kind of not be surprised when the operation occurred. And so they were, they probably approved it. And certainly they had approved um, a previous uh, a plan uh, for a Dieppe raid uh, known as Operation Rudder that was uh, cancelled in early July 1942, which there were definitely some changes in the plan. Uh, but, but in a large scheme of things, they had basically approved the plan. Um, you know, was it to test enemy defenses and combined operation techniques, including the capture of a port? A D-Day rehearsal has been an argument uh, in recent years. I'll, I'll deal with that a little bit later in the presentation. Was it to raise Allied morale? You know, a lot of these raids had good propaganda value for the British in particular. They could, you know, claim some easy successes, for instance. Was it to draw out the Luftwaffe, to get the Luftwaffe to come out and fight because they were, you know, defending France uh, from, you know, uh, British uh, uh, Commonwealth, you know, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, you know, uh, aircraft. Um, 
but the Luftwaffe could kind of decide when it wanted to come out and fight. And so maybe you could draw them out with a major amphibious assault like this. Uh, certainly, I think the, the Royal Air Force was interested in that uh, angle. Uh, although, you know, a single day raid is not going to result. It's going to result in a very big air battle, as we'll get to. But nothing that's as sustained as what, you know, you would need to do that in a significant way. Um, intelligence gathering, I've mentioned this before, you know, were the raiding forces after an Enigma machine in code books uh, to basically as a pin, as part of a pinch raid uh, to assist in the naval war that I described earlier. Um, David O'Keefe, who's a Canadian historian who's done a lot of work on this, I think he's absolutely proven uh, that the Enigma machine, or at least uh, the pinch part of the raid to hopefully capture an Enigma machine in the code books that would get them, you know, the, the materials they needed to penetrate the German the new German for Rotor Enigma codes. I think he's absolutely proven it was an objective of the raid. There's no doubt about that. The debate comes down to how central was that to the primary kind of goal of the raid. And for a long time, we've known that intelligence gathering was part of this uh, in terms of the air war. Uh, as I talked about Operation Biting and the uh, Wurzburg radar in Berneval, there was a Freya radar system uh, near Poorville, which is a small town uh, near Dieppe, and the hope was that uh, a radar technician uh, could get, could be escorted to the point by Canadian troops where he could get in uh, to that radar position, perhaps assemble the parts, or disassemble the parts and bringing them back to uh, the UK, or at the very least get an idea of, of how it worked. And he was able to do that to some degree, though not to the degree that he um, had hoped. Actually, he ended up being able to kind of go snip some uh, the telephone wires um, between the bunker and, you know, other headquarters. And so uh, they actually had to start communicating the Germans on the radio, which the Allies could listen into, and they could kind of gleam a little bit about how the Freya worked uh, from that, um, as well as kind of his observations watching the Freya, the antenna at work uh, when he was uh, near the bunker, but they couldn't get into the bunker itself with too much uh, German resistance. Artifact example, I want to do one of these for every zone. We did manage, it's no longer in the exhibition because it was a brief loan, but we were really thankful to have this loan of an Enigma 1 uh, cipher machine, which was actually a German army in, um, Enigma machine that was used, uh, put in service 1944 and used by the German military to code and decode uh, messages. Uh, but this, we wanted to have this machine to kind of, again, speak in the exhibition to this, you know, what may be the central purpose of the Dieppe raid, which was uh, to go after, you know, a machine like this, though it was a naval enigma they were looking for, a four-rotor na naval enigma, and the code books that went alongside it to hopefully help in that naval intelligence uh, uh, war. It was very excellent to have uh, uh, that artifact. Moving into zone two, this is where we talk about, you know, the plan for the raid, the size of the forces involved, and what actually happened. Um, this is the size of the naval force that was involved, uh, this infographic here. There are a total of 253 warships and landing craft involved. Uh, the vast majority of those were landing craft. Um, only eight destroyers uh, involved in, in this particular uh, operation. Uh, these were the heaviest warships that they uh, brought with them. Uh, this meant that the Allies had limited firepower offshore to support the landing. Uh, basically, four-inch guns was the best these destroyers uh, had. And these guns, unfortunately, uh, were not the most ideal in terms of hitting uh, various targets in and around Dieppe. Dieppe is characterized by a number of very steep cliffs on either side of the town. And the Germans had positions up on those cliffs, and it was very difficult for a destroyer, you know, um, fairly close, you know, to the shore to get a clear shot at, you know, uh, something that's on top of a cliff like that because of the trajectory that's involved. Um, Canadians were involved with these naval forces, although no Canadian warships were present. Uh, they served aboard landing craft with combined operations or aboard British warships in some cases. And there were a few Canadian landing craft crewmen and other British uh, and other Commonwealth uh, landing craft and other uh, 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 sailors who lost their lives in the course of this operation. In the air, there was quite an impressive showing uh, from the Allied Air Forces. Uh, 
Um, almost 1,200 aircraft were involved, and of those, 106 were lost. Uh, over 2,600 sorties, a single aircraft on a single mission, uh, were made during the course of the day. Um, and you can see the various types of aircraft uh, that were involved. Um, you have uh, the majority of them were Supermarine Spitfires, you know, the, the, the classic uh, British fighter plane. There were Hawker Hurricanes. Uh, the job of the Hawker Hurricane in this case was mostly as a fighter bomber. Uh, some of them had cannons and they could go and strafe enemy defenses. Uh, and some of them also carried uh, smoke bombs instead of regular bombs. The Hawker Typhoon would later go on to be a uh, ground support aircraft in, in Normandy and beyond. Um, but at this point, it was actually still being tested out as an interceptor, as a, as a, as a, as a strict fighter aircraft. Um, and they actually use these uh, uh, in a, um, they're actually using them in a, um, a decoy uh, type role during the operation. Uh, some American built aircraft involved here, actually quite a number of American built aircraft. You have the North American Mustang uh, fighter, which was used as a reconnaissance fighter uh, by Canadian and British squadrons at the time. Their job was essentially to kind of go in land in twos and fours and see if the Germans were sending up any um, uh, reinforcements to Dieppe. Uh, and then, you know, they could call back to, to get some bombers to come over and attack those uh, formations of troops if necessary. Um, these aircraft took quite heavy casualties just because of how they were used, uh, you know, in twos and fours, kind of going in land uh, fairly low to try to kind of scan. And, and that made them vulnerable to German fighter aircraft. You have um, a single Bristol Bowfighter, uh, which was actually, I believe, a night fighter. Later in the day, they send it out uh, uh, after uh, German aircraft that are uh, kind of maybe shadowing the um, uh, the fleet as it kind of egresses from Dieppe and tries to return uh, to England. You have um, 66 Douglas Boston light bombers. Uh, these were uh, primarily, uh, again, uh, bombs uh, to, to attack... Um, enemy gun batteries and enemy positions, as well as uh, smoke uh, to lay uh, smoke screens, uh, either for the naval forces or for the land forces ashore. The same sort of role for the Bristol uh, Blenheims as well. And then there were 24 B-17 uh, Flying Fortresses, and those were uh, U.S. Army Air Force Flying Fortresses, I think four squadrons worth of them. And they were on a diversionary attack as well. Their job was to bomb a local airfield to uh, hopefully prevent uh, some Luftwaffe activity uh, in the area, as well as to provide a diversion for the raid. The international representation among the Allied Air Forces is quite impressive. You have 43 Royal Air Force squadrons. You actually have 10 American squadrons total, seven from the United States Army Air Forces. That's the four B-17 squadrons and three U.S. Army Air Force uh, Spitfire squadrons as well. You also had uh, three Eagle squadrons, those being um, uh, Spitfire squadrons once again, uh, but were made up of Americans who were serving in the Royal Air Force, uh, who had joined the Royal Air Force before the Americans had joined the war. You had nine Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons involved. You had Polish squadrons, Czech squadrons, Norwegian squadrons, uh, a free French squadron, a Belgian squadron, uh, a New Zealand squadron, and even, it's not quite a Rosie, Rhodesian squadron, but it was sponsored uh, by Rhodesia. Uh, I don't think there were very many Rhodesians in the squadron, but it was sponsored by that nation, and so I kind of counted it that way. Uh, a total of 75 uh, uh, Allied squadrons uh, providing air support uh, uh, for the operation. I have to say, uh, close air support was still very much in its infancy at this point, um, the Allies, you know, the, the naval force or, or, the, or the, the ground forces ashore could call for support in terms of bomb or smoke, but these missions had to be organized back in the United Kingdom and aircraft could take more than a half an hour to arrive. And of course, maybe the target, maybe the situation's changed by then. Um, perhaps the most important role that the Air Force played was in defending the landing force and the fleet. This was done fairly effectively with just one major vessel of destroyer lost to NAB bombing. Um, Although the Allies did lose more planes than the Germans, they originally, the Allies thought they had shot down far more planes than they, than they actually had. Their loss rate was actually lower uh, than the German loss rate in terms of aircraft loss uh, versus uh, sorties. And these tended to be single pilot fighters. So a lot of Spitfires, a lot of Mustangs lost. 
but not very many larger bomber aircraft uh, were lost uh, by the Allies. The German Air Force, um, uh, for its part, didn't have nearly as many aircraft in the area, but what it but what it have uh, what it had got involved uh, uh, quite heavily. This actually was at this point in the war mainly due to the um, uh, the Royal Air Force's contribution. Uh, was kind of the largest single day air battle of the war to this point. Um, there's actually some people, conspiracy-ish theories that suggest maybe the Germans knew the Allies were coming and that helps to explain the disaster. Well, one indication that they didn't necessarily know the Allies were coming, they, they had an idea of when certain landings would occur, what, what time of the year, what time of the month would be best for a landing and so they could put their forces on alert. But in this case, um, the, the Germans didn't put their air force on alert at all. In fact, a bunch of their fighter pilots had been given the morning off. And so uh, they were actually a little bit late arriving to the scene. The landing force was able to land and, 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 and begin its operations without uh, too much German air interference. Um, the German aircraft losses were smaller than the Allies, but they started with many fewer aircraft and their loss rate was higher. And most of their losses, 50% of their losses, uh, were bombers rather than fighters. Uh, so they lost um, higher, you know, more complex aircraft to build and replace uh, and, and, and potentially lost more air crew that way as well. Um, one thing I have to say about especially the American contribution with those Eagle squadrons, uh, not with those Eagle squadrons necessarily, but with the U.S. Army Air Force squadrons, is that the first air-to-air -air kill by a American U.S. Army Air Force fighter aircraft in the European theater of war occurred in this operation. Uh, there's an American uh, second lieutenant whose name escapes me, um, second lieutenant because it's American, of course, um, who shot down or at least claimed to have shot down a Falk Wolf 190 uh, fighter aircraft. And so that was considered the first uh, of kind of the eight Air Forces, uh, I believe, uh, kills. The Eighth Air Force was really just getting going at this point, and, and, and the B-17 raid was one of the first operations uh, that they were on. Looking at the Allied order of battle, you had just under 5,000 Canadians involved, about a, just, you know, almost, you know, 1,057 British commandos involved uh, assisting the Canadians, 50 U.S. Army Rangers sprinkled throughout the force, um, and especially with the uh, British commandos. Again, I think the first um, American uh, fatal casualties and, and perhaps casualties otherwise in the war against Nazi Germany occurred during the Dieppe raid uh, when some of their forces uh, got involved uh, with the British commandos. There were some free French troops as well with the commandos, you know, perhaps there, especially for translation, and uh, anti-Nazi enemy nationals from uh, X troop of number 10 inter-allied commando uh, you know, people who, you know, from perhaps like Austria or Germany who had left uh, for, for various reasons, you know, because they were anti-Nazi and had joined the, the Allied Commando Forces um, in resistance uh, uh, to Germany. We have this, in the exhibit, we have this really brilliant map, which, which is, I, you can see in front of you, and it's really blown up on the wall. So it must be one of the largest maps of Dieppe kind of <laughs> created since the Second World War. And I'll use it, what we did with this map is to try to indicate in kind of hashed red what was supposed to happen. And then in red, the landings themselves and what actually happened. Um, so I'll try to go through this. Um, basically, the plan for the Dieppe raid relied almost entirely on supply surprise. There was no preliminary bombardment really to speak of. Um, and it was the idea was to come in darkness and land before the Germans, you know, had a chance to react. The problem with this strategy is that the landings on the flanks out here at Orange Beach one and two, and Yellow Beach two and one, and then Blue Beach here at Puy with the Royal Regiment of Canada, and then the South Saskatchewan Regiment landing at Green Beach. These landings were meant to take place in advance of the main landing on the beaches at Dieppe here. And so while these landings may, you know, would have achieved surprise in ideal circumstances, certainly the main landings would not have achieved surprise and, and didn't achieve surprise because they were going to necessarily follow these other landings. And the reason these landings had to take place first was because you had various German coastal defense batteries on the flanks or 
German positions on cliffs overlooking the main beach that needed to be dealt with before the main landing force arrived. And so those forces had to go in first, but it meant that, you know, some of the force, especially the white and red beaches here, were not going to achieve tactical surprise and were going to have to, you know, deal with uh, an enemy that was aware that something uh, was going on. Unfortunately, uh, while this landing on, on the flank over here at uh, Orange Beach was quite successful and they managed to knock out the artillery battery and the uh, coastal battery over here was actually not knocked out entirely, but rather they managed to snipe at it for most of the day, uh, making it uh, very difficult for the German soldiers to man it and to fire out at the ships at sea. So those went fairly well, but the Canadians on kind of a main beach in front of uh, Dieppe, and especially at Blue Beach here on the flank, uh, just didn't get very far very quickly. And I'll explain, especially on Main Beach, kind of why that was the case. Blue Beach, I have a photo later to show you. This is just one of the worst places you can imagine to land. It's a very narrow draw uh, with cliffs on, you know, high cliffs on both sides. Uh, wouldn't take a lot to defend that area. A couple of machine guns and, you know, you can pin down an entire uh, battalion, which is what happened uh, pretty well on that morning. Uh, but various things went wrong. Uh, the force that was supposed to land at Blue Beach early ended up being late uh, because the, the naval force or the naval um, uh, landing craft uh, actually went in the wrong direction and almost landed uh, here on the main beach. And so by the time they went over uh, to the right spot, they were late. The sun was up and the Germans could see uh, what was going on. The other factor that worked against the folks at Blue Beach very sadly is... Uh, in the course of bringing the commando force ashore at Yellow Beach, there was a convoy battle offshore. Uh, that actually didn't necessarily doom the force, but what happened was the local garrison commander uh, became, you know, he saw something was going on. They didn't think anything was going to happen, but he decided to do an anti-invasion drill right at that time as a result, because everybody was up already. And as a result, the Royal Regiment of Canada from Toronto at Blue Beach, you know, went into a very deadly situation indeed. Now, uh, there was tank support for the forces on the main beaches. The tank support, unfortunately, again, due to navigational issues and, and, and you know, space to, to, to actually access the beaches, you know, in the landing craft, it was a few minutes late. And unfortunately, this was enough to really stymie the uh, Canadian in particular advance. Basically, the tanks were supposed to support the infantry onto their objectives. But with the tanks not there, the infantry quickly became uh, pinned down. Uh, much is made uh, of the fact that the beaches at Dieppe are, you know, they're fairly, they're composed of fairly large church stones. And uh, a lot has been said about how this caused the tanks to throw their tracks and become immobilized and being unable to move up the beach uh, to support the infantry. It was a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, basically, out of the number of tanks landed, which was 27, um, 15 did manage to get off the, the, the church beach and cross the seawall. But what happened was Dieppe, it was, you know, a beach that was, went right into the town. And there were only so many access points into the town from the beach along the streets there. And most of these, if not all of them, had been blocked by, you know, rubble and by roadblocks that the Germans had established to defend, you know, the port and to defend the town. And so, unfortunately, because the Canadian infantry and engineers had been pinned down in the early moments and weren't directly supported by the tanks immediately, a lot of the engineers whose job it was to go and blow those obstacles were not, you know, standing anymore, unfortunately. Many of them had been killed or wounded, and they couldn't, you know, make those breach points. And as a result, the tanks, which didn't have very heavy weaponry on them, not at least not heavy enough to breach those points themselves, they couldn't really go anywhere. And that's why a lot of the tanks ended up going back to the beach and actually setting themselves up sideways, as you can see in this middle photo, to try to provide cover for what infantry were still fighting um, on the beach. Um, and so it is generally overstated about, you know, how, how badly the tanks did. The tanks actually did quite well. The problem was the coordination wasn't there on the day. Uh, 
so that everybody could do the job that needed to be done to breach those defenses and to get off the beach, which is the most important uh, uh, piece. At the end of the day, the casualties were just absolutely devastating, especially for uh, the Canadian assault force. Um, there were 807 Canadians killed in action during these uh, during this kind of nine hour stretch. Later, uh, 28 would die of wounds, you know, back in the United Kingdom who had been evacuated. 72 Canadians also died as prisoners of war, many of whom would have died of their wounds in prisoners of war camps. A little bit more on the prisoner of war experience later. Just an absolutely devastating day uh, for Canada. A couple of artifact examples uh, from the exhibition. We actually have, again, from the War Heritage Institute, a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine the type of engine that was used on the Spitfire and other uh, aircraft involved uh, in the raid to try to give people a sense of the scale of some of these aircraft as they stand in the exhibition. Also have this facsimile of a pigeon message, message copy sent by Lieutenant Colonel John D. Macbeth, who was head of 2nd Canadian Division Signals, uh, basically back to uh, the Canadian First Corps headquarters in the UK, explaining very heavy casualties in men and troops. Uh, men and ships did everything possible to get men off, but in order to get any away, had to come to sad decision to abandon remainder. remainder. Uh, this was a joint decision by the force commanders. Obviously, the operation completely lacked surprise. At least that was the feeling uh, at the time. Zone 3, we, we, we wanted to make sure that we didn't just end things with the Dieppe raid. We wanted to talk about the impact of that raid, you know, in the days, months, and years uh, later. And the propaganda war was an incredibly important part of this. Um, both sides used the raid as a propaganda weapon. We can see some Axis propaganda here. On the left, you have a propaganda poster, um, uh, actually a French propaganda, a Vichy French propaganda poster, uh, that was used uh, by uh, the Vichy government and by Germany to show how the French in Dieppe had supported Germany. So what they did is they actually, the um, uh, Hitler offered to pay the mayor of Dieppe a certain sum of mon money to thank the city for its cooperation in helping to oppose uh, the Allied uh, landing at Dieppe. Uh, the, the mayor said, well, no, I'm not interested in your money and I'm not interested in you, you know, having a propaganda, you know, victory out of this. But what I would be interested in is if you'd be willing to release the Dieppe POWs from back in 1940 that were, you know, in Germany, uh, you know, uh, in German prisoner of war camps. And so he managed to secure the release of 1500 French POWs. Um, and the Germans uh, and the, the Vichy French uh, kind of still decided we're going to use this as a propaganda uh, uh, victory and show the cooperation between, you know, Vichy France and Germany. Uh, French POWs were later quite ashamed of this, um, uh, that they had been released because, you know, as a result of so much uh, death, and especially in terms of uh, the Canadian sacrifice. Uh, the, the poster on the right is a Lithuanian, well, it's a German propaganda poster aimed at Lithuania and uh, basically showcasing a lot of the images that the German uh, kind of war correspondents and photog photographers and soldiers uh, took after the raid to document, you know, its results uh, for the Allies. Now, uh, the Germans had control of the beach and could take whatever photos they wanted, often posing, you know, Allied troops in the process. And these images were used as proof that the Second Front had failed. The bloody defeat of the Allies in the West, you know, would show the, their audience that Germany could comfortably focus on the war against the Soviets. And uh, that was, you know, a big part of the German reaction to the raid is they could use this to, you know, buck up the home front and say, look, we've already dealt with that Second Front. It's not an issue anymore. The Allies don't know what they're doing. You know, Churchill's, you know, naive militarily. Um, we can focus on the real war, which is against, you know, the Soviet Union in the East. Allied propaganda, um, really good quote here from uh, historian Timothy Balzer, who said, a close look at the communication strategy of combined operations headquarters concludes that overall, the story fed to the newspapers had been written in advance regardless of the raid's outcome. So the Allied press largely facilitated and amplified the military's chosen messages about the raid, 
And there actually were two PR plans that the Allies had come up with, Combined Operations Headquarters had come up with um, for the raid. In case of a victory, the focus was going to be on the success and heroism of the troops. And in the case of defeat, lessons learned would be the main focus, along with heroism as a constant. The irony is, originally, when uh, the PR machine got going in the immediate aftermath of the raid, they actually went with the victory PR plan by mistake. Uh, and only a little, a couple of days later, changed it to the defeat PR plan. Uh, of course, both of which involved uh, heroism being constant. Um, and heroism was very much, you know, at the center of a lot of the propaganda, you know, even Canadians uh, uh, were, were, were subject to. You have uh, in the Men of Valor series, They Fight For You, this propaganda poster, which features the daring exploits of Lieutenant Colonel Merritt of the South Saskatchewan Regiment, who won a Victoria Cross uh, during the Dieppe raid. Uh, and it says when last seen, he was seen collecting Bren and Tommy guns and preparing a defensive position which successfully covered the withdrawal from the beach. So the Allies really made use of, you know, heroism uh, to, to show, you know, uh, you know, just how much heroism had been involved at Dieppe and, and how you know hard the Canadians had fought. Um, they also pointed especially to the over... Um, exaggerated air victories as well uh, and the air battle as a success and as it turned out you know i think the air battle was a fair success for the for the allied air forces but it wasn't anything kind of like what their their pr machine was spinning at the time the other component of of kind of this part of the exhibition is um we called it families waiting for news and so trying to filter through that news that was coming back you know you know from the uk and, and from dieppe uh, were families and friends who were desperate to find out what had happened to their loved ones. And it took the, t the Canadian Army time to verify their casualty lists. And, you know, many uh, of the soldiers who were listed as, you know, missing in action in August 1942, you know, weren't even, you know, listed in, um, until maybe two years later uh, as killed in action when, you know, all efforts to kind of determine what had happened to them, you know, had failed. And, you know, checking the lists of Canadians who were prisoners of war in, in Germany uh, and, in, and in Central Europe. Um, eventually, people would hear news from those who were captured via mail because they were able to send mail through the Red Cross, or even those who had escaped to England with the, uh, with the withdrawal force. Um, the wounded who made it back to England, or even those who were exchanged with German POWs, often eventually returned to Canada uh, and, and, and told their stories. Um, I had this quite poignant um, example of Mary McLean, who lost her 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 son Lance Corporal Robert McLean uh, at Dieppe, and it took her some time to come to the realization that he he was in fact dead and had not survived the raid, and she was very upset with this particular image, where she thought one of the men in it looked like her son, and she thought her son was still possibly alive, and once she kind of came to terms with that. She asked why the papers were allowed to capitalize on our soul, sorrow in the loss of so dear a son. I will never forget it. So she was quite disappointed and distraught that the papers were able to kind of publish, you know, pictures like this, you know, that caused her such uh, grief and anguish. We tried to also make it clear to our audience in the exhibition just how widespread uh, this disaster was for Canada and just the casualties and, and their impact across the country. Uh, and that's that's what these series of pie charts are meant to do to give you an an idea of you know where the where the where the people you know may have come from. It was the this is grouping by um, by the garrison headquarters, so whatever battalion uh, they were involved in uh, and where it was headquartered. Uh, and it just the, the devastation was you know really across the country, especially focused in Ontario and Quebec, uh, but across the country uh, as well. And so two of our most populous provinces. Uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, the, the harsh reality of war uh, in that uh, late summer of 1942. There were also a uh, really cool propaganda or propaganda artifact example is uh, this um, composite image of uh, Ross Monroe, who was a Canadian war correspondent who was at Dieppe visiting with the Essex Scottish Regiment and explaining from his perspective what had happened at Dieppe. Uh, to people who are anxiously waiting for news of, about their loved ones. And Ross Monroe, as a, as a war correspondent, was able to um, return home much faster 
uh, and, and to tell those stories uh, uh, to the Canadian public. He actually went on a tour. He went to Hamilton. He went to Montreal. He went to Toronto uh, to try to, you know, to talk to the, the families and loved ones and, you know, uh, of, 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 of the units that had suffered so heavily. We also have a zone on uh, the captivity experience um, uh, because, of course, you know, 900, uh, 807 Canadians died, were killed in action at Dieppe, but uh, th a couple of thousand Canadians uh, were made prisoners of war um, during the operation, and they had to endure, you know, a number of years uh, beyond uh, uh, the raid itself in, in uh, German captivity. Uh, let me find my notes here to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, this is kind of a, 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 one of our infographics that shows kind of where they were held and what their journey was like. So uh, they were, you know, they were captured at Dieppe, uh, where there was a hospital uh, that was um, actually a couple of hospitals that were uh, caring for the wounded uh, on both sides of the conflict. Uh, the walking wounded and the those who were uninjured uh, were actually marched to Envermeu, which is the headquarters of the local uh, German uh, garrison. Then uh, they were uh, taken uh, from there uh, to Rouen, where they joined with um, the more heavily wounded um, who were being cared for in hospitals at Rouen. Uh, and then they were moved to, uh, again, the walking wounded still marching to vernel sur avre where they were put on trains and eventually sent uh, to the east to prisoner of war camps, uh, either in uh, Germany proper or in uh, modern uh, Poland, actually, uh, in some cases. Uh, along the way, there was a train stop at Memoines, uh, Belgium. And the Canadians on these trains uh, were actually kind of, again, they were treated as kind of propaganda pieces. Uh, the trains were painted with slogans, you know, second front kaput, that sort of thing, and put on display so that the citizens of, you know, France and Belgium could see, you know, this is what results when, you know, people try to defy the Nazis, that sort of thing. Um, and at Momoines, Belgium, they actually left uh, the Canadians, uh, many of whom, the, the officers were in carriages, but the enlisted men were in cattle cars and were put in cattle cars uh, in, in much larger numbers than they were supposed to be, you know, uh, the, the kind of 40 and eight type type cattle cars, uh, 40 men, eight horses. There were, you know, maybe, you know, 60 men, 80 men in a single car with very little uh, space uh, for, you know, obviously, you know, personal space, uh, very little space for anybody to go to the washroom in a sanitary fashion. And they were left for something like eight hours on the railway in the heat of the summer uh, without much access to food or, you know, sanitary breaks or anything like that. And so the Belgians have actually... Um, I actually have a lovely little memorial there uh, uh, to that event uh, with a, I believe it's a replica carriage uh, like the one uh, uh, that uh, the Canadians, uh, the type that the Canadians would have been in. Um, the Canadians are taken to a number of uh, uh, POW camps. Uh, the red uh, boxes are uh, generally uh, the POW hospitals that many of the Canadians uh, stayed in. Also, you had, um, uh, uh, where is it? Offlag 8B, uh, uh, Offlag being an officer prisoner of war camp uh, in Eichstadt, and uh, number one being Kolditz Castle, Offlag um, 4C, which is an infamous place uh, where they took, typically took kind of political pl prisoners. They typically took uh, prisoners who would kind of, officers who would kind of continuously make escape attempts. So it was a bit of a high security prison. And then the, the other Canadians, uh, the enlisted were taken actually to uh, number two here, to Lambsdorff, Stalag 8B, is where most of them were for the early part of their time in captivity. Eventually, many of them were actually sent to the number three here, which is uh, Stalag 2D at Stargard. Uh, and then you have uh, Stalag Luft 3, the site of the uh, great, infamous Great Escape, and many of the airmen who were captured uh, during the Dieppe raid uh, were, were taken there as well. In 1945, when the Soviet Red Army came through the area, uh, the, uh, there were forced marches uh, of these prisoners. And so these are some of the um, routes that they had to take to move away uh, from the Soviets in the east, and then in some cases away from the Americans and British and Canadians uh, and French, I suppose, as well in the, in the west. Um, and so uh, 
you know, especially for those who were in the East and had to get away from the Soviets uh, at the orders of the German prison guards, uh, that was another um, ordeal they had to uh, go through. Number of really interesting artifact examples uh, in this uh, section uh, that we had uh, some uh, in particular, uh, we had some postcards that were sent in captivity from officers, Canadian officers back to their uh, superior officer in Canada. We have the replica of a stove heater made by a prisoner of war, the type of thing that the uh, Canadians would build to, you know, uh, help with their kind of everyday lives to make them a little easier to have something that could heat up a little bit of food, that sort of thing. Um, and we also have the uh, Canadian Red Cross box and mess equipment, that sort of thing that would have been sent uh, hopefully to the prisoners uh, um, so that they could have a little bit of a supplement uh, to the diet that the, uh, the Germans provided them. Finally, and I want to end uh, relatively soon for any questions, we have a section on remembering uh, in, in our exhibition. Although we call the exhibition From Dieppe to Juno, we do not necessarily want to portray it as a straightforward path between the Dieppe Raid and D-Day. Um, the Dieppe Raid has often been looked upon as kind of a uh, dress rehearsal for D-Day. Um, I think generally that every operation uh, gives uh, the military the chance to learn lessons, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that this one in particular was the primary goal was to learn lessons. It was perhaps one of the objectives, but it's not really an important component of the plan or anything like that. It's almost more the PR angle um, you know, again, that PR plan, if, if the raid is, a, you know, a failure, we're going to emphasize the lessons learned part of it. That is, you know, perhaps explains a lot of, of the, the, the discourse behind that. We also want to show, in, and we show it on this map, that there are many other amphibious operations. I already mentioned Operation Torch in November 1942. There was Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily in July of 1943. Uh, op other operations in Italy. You had all these major amphibious landings uh, that predated uh, June 6, 1944 in Normandy. And these were all operations, unlike a single day raid meant to capture limited objectives, these were all operations meant to establish a bridgehead and to, you know, destroy the German military in that area or to, uh, you know, at least liberate those areas and to push the Germans back. And those are very different operations to plan for uh, uh, than you know, uh, something like the Dieppe raid, uh, which perhaps offered some lessons in tactics, but depending on, you know, how you look at it, you know, maybe the, the sacrifice wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessary to learn uh, some of those lessons that you needed, you know, a lot of firepower to support uh, the landings, for instance. Um, and this is just a, an infographic that compares some of that support and some of the force uh, between what happened at Dieppe and uh, the Juno Beach in particular, uh, and Operation Jubilee and Operation Neptune, which is the D-Day landings in particular. You can just see how much more support is afforded uh, uh, to the D-Day landings. You know, the number of tanks involved, the number of aircraft involved, the number of, you know, warships and other vessels involved on D-Day, the amount of artillery that was involved in supporting the efforts on Juno Beach. You know, you had some 300 guns that the Canadians landed with on Juno Beach, there were no guns landed with the, uh, the Canadians um, uh, at the EP. In fact, there were some artillery um, soldiers, some gunners uh, with the force, but their job was actually to capture German positions and to use them against the enemy uh, rather than bring their own uh, guns themselves. We also bring the audience full circle. Uh, we want to give them the idea, you know, an understanding that, you know, while the Dieppe raid wasn't great failure, um, the Canadians did return to Dieppe in September of 1944, and that, in fact, the same division, the Second Canadian Infantry Division, that landed at Dieppe in August of 1942, actually liberated the town. And we wanted to give, um, to bring things full circle with that, because of course that liberation would never have happened without the success at Juno Beach, without the success on all the D-Day landing beaches on D-Day, and the the victory in the Battle of Normandy as well. And of course, that's where uh, the museum is in France. We also wanted to leave people in the exhibition with a little bit of a note about the legacies of Dieppe, uh, healing, uh, heritage, uh, and memory. Um, the veterans of Dieppe carried physical and emotional scars with them for many years uh, down the road. Uh, 
um, they actually felt slighted because no medal was awarded for Dieppe until the Dieppe bar was added to the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal, as you can see on the left here, uh, in 1991. And that class was added um, and, was, and was advocated for uh, by uh, veterans associations uh, because many of these veterans, perhaps especially the ones who were prisoners of war, they had nothing, you know, on their uniforms to show that they had been at Dieppe. You know, other campaigns were marked with campaign medals, but there was nothing uh, for Dieppe. Uh, Dieppe, uh, over the years, has become very much a symbol of, you know, senseless carnage, uh, I think, in Canada, but also, you know, elsewhere in the world. In Canada, it fit well into a post-war Canadian nationalism that embraced peacekeeping and downplayed our connections to the UK, even though it was Canadian pride that arguably had helped to lead to our involvement in the raid to get the Canadian military involved in the war. Um, we had this excellent um, sign uh, as part of the exhibition uh, provided by the Canadian War Museum. And this is a protest sign from 2006, um, which basically puts, uh, it was a protest sign against the war in Afghanistan. Uh, the Canadian battle group was in Kandahar for much of that war. And uh, it put Kandahar, whoever designed the sign, put Kandahar alongside Dieppe and Beaumont Hamel, another great, you know, disaster for Newfoundland tro troops in the First World War. And they put them all on the same sign as suicide missions as a kind of a commentary on, on, you know, how they felt about the war in Afghanistan. And so the Dieppe raid is used in this way, kind of in our popular, uh, not popular culture, but rather in our, in our, you know, cultural movements and that sort of thing. Um, only in the last 20 years, in fact, or so, has D-Day in Juneau Beach become more central to the Canadian memory of the Second World War than Dieppe. I think for many, many decades after the Second World War, the Dieppe raid was kind of the first battle anyone, you know, the average Canadian, I think, would have thought about and known about uh, for the Second World War, which was very strange because, you know, we were a nation that was, you know, had, you know, with the support of the British, our own beach on D-Day, and... Uh, were very much part of the victory during uh, against Nazi Germany, and yet we focused on you know a single day in August 1942. Absolutely, the casualties were horrendous, but that was just one day, and, and Canada participated in so much more and made such a much larger contribution to the war, and so we we dealt with that um, in this exhibition. Um, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, I had a couple more slides in here, uh, but I want to kind of leave everybody uh, with one kind of last word, and that is this quote uh, from Brian Loring Villa, Villa, who wrote Unauthorized Action, Mountbatten and the Dieppe Raid. I think his central thesis about Mountbatten launching an unauthorized action is not quite correct, but he has a lot of very insightful things to say about the Dieppe Raid, and one of them is this, disasters bring us face to face with the limits of our abilities to offer explanations, and that was one of the driving forces behind the exhibit. We didn't want to necessarily tell anybody what to think about the raid. It's a very controversial part of Canadian history, but we wanted to provide people with, you know, the information so that they can make up their own minds. And I hope that's, uh, I hope that's come across today. And, and thanks so very much for tuning in. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Alex, for that awesome presentation. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have a question myself and I have one in the comments. So I'll take the one from the comments first because my, my peeps come first. I'll come, I'll come <laughs> after that. That's what's funny. Uh, tumbleweed weed. I hope you're still here. Uh, weren't the guns offshore critical for the raid success? You might have gone over that with the landings, Alex, but uh, the, they may not have been here at that time for that particular thing. Right. Um, well, I mean, the raid was, was, was obviously a failure. Um, the guns offshore, the problem you have is there's only eight destroyers and they only have, a, you know, each of them only have, I think, uh, maybe maybe two pairs of, of four inch guns. And the issue, of course, being the destroyers have to do two roles. They have to provide, well, three roles for some of them, because some of them are headquarters ships as well that are being used by the commanders to make decisions and that sort of thing. The other thing that all the destroyers have to do is they have to provide escort. They have to, you know, watch against enemy naval incursions, you know, U-boats, that sort of thing. And then they also have to try to support the forces, you know, ashore with their guns. And that's a that's a lot to ask of eight destroyers, let's put it that way. And so uh, the bombardment just simply was not heavy enough. And they were far too reliant on surprise for success than on the use of firepower. And, and certainly there wasn't enough to provide even suppress enough to suppress the enemy, let alone destroy any of the enemy positions, unfortunately.
Uh, Rob McGuire, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I don't see the Toronto Scottish listed on the Dieppe maps I've seen. Interested as my uncle was with the Toronto Scots at Dieppe. I've only I've read only 125 Toronto Scots landed, but where? Thanks. Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, I believe so. The Toronto Scottish Regiment was a, a machine gun battalion, machine gun and mortar battalion, which was uh, with the Second uh, Canadian Infantry Division. Um, I believe they were kind of sprinkled in among some of the other units uh, to provide additional kind of machine gun support. Um, I'm not even quite sure how many of them landed. Um, if I had, uh, I have a notebook with all the casualties listed in it, but the Toronto Scottish, they do take casualties, but they're relatively light compared to most of the other units. So I expect in some cases they may not have even landed, um, but obviously it would vary depending on, you know, what units uh, they were supporting and, and who they were with. But that was typically the experience, even in Northwest Europe, of units like the Toronto Scottish Regiment, um, where they would be parceled out in small numbers to other units to uh, increase their firepower. Yeah, Rob Rob uh, said uh, he's trying to figure out if his own yeah. actually landed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that kind of goes back into your theory there, Alex, with that. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing, because the evacuations of the beachhead for what it was, uh, there were certain beachheads that were more developed than others, and some of them were hardly developed at all. Um, the, it was very chaotic, and the beach was under fire, and, you know, the, the, the allies, the, the, the naval forces did their best to get troops away, but in many cases, many of the, the, the Canadians that made it back unscathed never actually, you know, got onto land in the first place. Because uh, many of the guys who did make it to the land, uh, unfortunately, went into the bag as prisoners of war. So you talked about uh, the change about the, the what Canadians see from the Second World War. It was about Dieppe for the longest time, and, and then it kind of switched over to D-Day. Is that because of cultural uh, pop history because that it seems like that was about the time of Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, that kind of thing. Was there was there a movement that was like, well, wait a minute, we were there too, and and you start to see that in in historical narratives, or was it something else? I think it's a combination of factors. I think even like the war in Vietnam and generally the the peace movements, you know, of kind of the nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, probably had an impact. And it was just kind of wrapped up in that narrative, you know, war is generally a bad thing. And I absolutely agree with that. We shouldn't glorify war. Uh, but that being said, it, you know, uh, I guess the really great quote I, I love, uh, which is uh, Matthew Halton, one of our Canadian war correspondents in the Second World War, basically said, um, you know, great things happen during war, but, but wars are terrible things. And I think we sometimes miss that nuance and we focus so much on on the devastating catastrophe because it fits with that narrative, perhaps, you know, these troops were, you know, you know, sent to the, sent to the slaughter or uh, just the, the mystery surrounding it, you know, not a hundred percent knowing exactly what it was for, you know, has a role, I think as well. Um, uh, it, 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 it's almost more like kind of a, it feels like a futile endeavor as well. Like even if there was an objective behind it, they obviously didn't really accomplish it. And so it kind of reads like a first world war battle in some ways uh, where, you know, what was it all for again? And so it really does align itself with that. Uh, and, and I think a lot of those themes kind of around remembrance um, and, you know, the pity of war, that sort of thing. Um, I think those things all played a role. I also think, that you're right about kind of the 1990s, the early uh, uh, 2000s, uh, Canada kind of woke up in many ways to its effort during the Second World War, especially as those veterans began to retire in larger numbers um, and kind of advocate for themselves and, um, and also to uh, kind of commemorate uh, what they had been through. Uh, especially in kind of 19, you know, 94, 1995 with the, uh, I guess it would have been the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the 50th anniversary of victory in Europe, especially with Canadians going, uh, the veterans returning to the Netherlands in particular in 1995. Uh, and Tim Cook writes about this in his, uh, one of his most latest books uh, on kind of the memory of the second world war in Canada and how they were welcomed with open arms. The media was there, you know, covered it. And Canadians started to wake up at that point. Uh, 
I think there is kind of abandoned brothers, you know, aspect to it, you know, in the early 2000s, late 90s with Saving Private Ryan as well, you know, um, very sadly, you know, you look at a movie like um, The Longest Day, there's hardly a mention of Canadian in that film. Um, in fact, I think the one time they have a scene that's ostensibly Juno Beach, because there's a character in the film that's supposed to be on Juno Beach, he's actually in that scene, I think he's actually on... Um, I think he's actually on Sword Beach instead, and they just decided to make it a British beach and have Sean Con Connery come ashore at the same time and all that stuff. So, yeah. you know, very much we've been frustrated over the years by, you know, just not being included or being just rolled into the British story. Um, and uh, and I think that, you know, came to a head a little bit with, you know, Saving Private Ryan with Band of Brothers and, like, wanting to tell our own story to some degree as well. So those major anniversaries uh, with the veterans still with us, I think played a huge role in, in changing that narrative. And I would say, you know, honestly, the presence of the Juno Beach Center and the role that our founding veterans played in trying to, um, you know, mark uh, the Second World War. The, D the Juno Beach Center is not just a D-Day museum, even though it's on the D-Day landing beaches, it's a Canadian Second World War Museum and it tells the complete story of Canada during the Second World War. And so I think the effort that our veteran founders made and, 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 and the, um, the grassroots support they received in the late 90s and early 2000s to build the museum, both rode the wave of kind of Band of Brothers uh, and that sort of thing, but also um, surfed atop it and, and helped it, you know, in Canada become a little bit stronger as well. That's awesome. I, I hope that, uh, I'm sure there are people already brainstorming like two years from now, what, what's gonna, what's gonna be going on at, Juno Beach Center because I, I know how planning works in public history and when it's a big deal like an 80th anniversary or something people are already starting to think about that I know I'm already starting to think about I would love to be over there <laughs> for for the 80th I have yet to visit so I want to I, I would love to get there and, and see that and, and and experience the the area that we've talked about twice now yeah uh, on, on here uh, I think that'd be a fantastic thing. And I know we've kept you a while, so uh, you got to get some rest since you got the new <laughs> now, as much as you can. So, Alex, I really appreciate you coming on tonight and, and discussing DF 80 years later. And uh, I hope that uh, we get to reconnect here in the future and do another one. Absolutely. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody, for uh, putting up with our technical glitch that we had on Facebook. Uh, hopefully you gravitated over here. I know many of you may not have, so I'm going to repost this onto the website here as soon as we are done so you can see it on Facebook. We won't be live, but you can at least see it there. Uh, but we appreciate everyone hanging out with us on YouTube and Twitter tonight. I uh, hope you have a fantastic night, everybody. Please be safe, be well, keep reading, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.